Welcome everyone to our presentation tonight. It's a review of Doug Batchelor's Pinnacle of Prophecy series. Uh, we're going to make a couple of reports, uh, maybe two or three, on uh, certain prophecy presentations that he's done in this series. And the uh, first one we're going to start with is Satan's Mark or God's Seal. That's episode 14. And uh, <clears throat> we thought that this would be enlightening for the brethren. And uh, hopefully you will gain some insight as to uh, the interpretations that Doug Brat Batchelor brings to the uh, Revelation understanding. And uh, we'll look at it closely so that we can uh, rightly divide the word of truth. So before we begin, we ask that you kneel and pray, claim the promise of John 16, 13, and he will be faithful and guide us into all truth. Let us begin. Okay, so we're going to begin with the first point that we thought, we thought was uh, uh, noteworthy, and that is what are the keys to unlocking prophecy? Uh, Doug had uh, made a... Uh, a remark and statement about what the keys are. So we're going to take a look at this one first. Studies about. Amen? We've told us along the way the key to understanding these prophecies in Revelation are the stories in the Bible. Out of 404 verses in Revelation, 278 are found in the Old Testament. That's where the keys are. You go back to the very beginning. studies about. Amen? All right, so let's uh, uh, re-emphasize what uh, Pastor Batchelor said. We've told us along the way the key to understanding these prophecies in Revelation are the stories in the Bible. Out of 404 verses in Revelation, 278 are found in the Old Testament. That's where the keys are. All right, now let's compare that to Scripture. We also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter 1, verses 19 to 21. So here we see a real striking uh, difference uh, according to Pastor Batchelor, uh, we can understand Revelation by doing a uh, study. In other words, uh, learn upon ourselves the stories of the Bible, and then we can understand what Revelation is saying. However, Scripture is telling us something completely different. It's saying that no prophecy of the Scriptures is of any private interpretation. So, this is in direct contrast to what we're told in this presentation. Uh, we, we know that looking at the uh, scripture there to Peter, that God's prophets are the ones that are going to interpret the scriptures. And this is very key because uh, we know that Doug Batchelor, as far as we know, is not not a prophet of God. He's never claimed to be one. He's, he's been missed on quite a few other things in his presentations uh, throughout history. So we know that's not true. So we're at a quandary here, brethren, about this first point, which is kind of very important if you, if you dwell into the uh, council here. Now, God, in his infinite wisdom, gave us the answer to understanding prophecy. And of course, that's found in Zechariah 4. We don't have time to go over that whole lesson, but we are going to put a study outline guide in the uh, uh, description box below. So you can uh, feel free to click that link and you'll get a good, solid uh, study outline of this prophecy. But basically, we'll go into it real quick. Um, the Spirit Prophecy and the Elijah Message both indicate that the Scriptures say that this uh, one tree on the left and one tree on the right represents the Old and New Testaments. And uh, the two pipes are the two inspired messengers in the Christian dispensation. So these are the ones that down through history uh, are the ones that God uh, delegated to go into the Old and New Testaments and bring out the golden oil. This is the uh, uh, prophecy about golden oil, which is the spirit of prophecy truth. 
and they take that oil and put it into the golden bowl, and that's the spirit of prophecy. Then the tubes, which represent the ministers, take that oil and distribute it to the candlesticks, which is symbolic of the church. So in this way, we understand prophecy as God intended uh, system is. And again, like I said, uh, Zechariah 4 is a great study, and we'll put an outline so you can get more familiar with that. All right, so at this point, we're going to bring in another uh, point that uh, the presentation makes, and that is Isaiah 4.1. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man. What's a woman represent in prophecy? Saying, we will wear our own apparel, we will eat our own bread, only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Talking about in the last days, you've got all these churches. They want his name. They want to call themselves Christian. But they said, we'll wear our own apparel, our own righteousness. We'll have our own interpretation of the word. But we want to call ourselves Christians. That's where we're at today. You know, the Christian church is the most divided religion in the world. Now, there are many divisions of Islam and there are divisions of Judaism. But Christianity takes the cake. Hundreds of denominations. How do you know where to go? Do you think that's the kind of church Jesus is coming back for? Or is he going to pull people together based on the word in the last days? Things are going to be shaken in our world. People are going to be driven to God. The devil's going to exploit that fear to make religious laws that are wrong. And God is going to allow these trials to draw his people back to his word and back to a unity among believers. You're going to see that happening. Okay, so right here we heard something that is true. Uh, Isaiah 4.1 is talking about today's situation with all the multi-sects and the different interpretations and so forth. But we want to remember that the Lord doesn't put these uh, scriptures, for instance, Isaiah 4.1, in there for a trinket. In other words, it's got to have a, a lesson to it. And we get the lesson from understanding the context of why the Lord put that in there. And we can find the lesson uh, very, very uh, powerfully in the understanding of the Elijah message. And, and we'll read this because this is the context of, of which the Lord wants us to understand Isaiah 4.1. Seven women take hold of one man. Today are we, we are to continue our study of the book Isaiah, book of Isaiah, beginning with the first verse of the fourth chapter. Isaiah 4.1, Isaiah 4, And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread, wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. The first thing we need to know is the time indicated by the term in that day. The ante, antecedent of the word that that day is found in verses 13 and 14 of the preceding chapters, of which the fourth chapter is a continuation. These verses point out that that day is the judgment day, the day in which the sanctuary, the church, is cleansed, the harvest day. So pointing to that day in which we are now living, to the judgment day, the scripture figuratively reveals that all, for that is what the biblical number seven indicates, the churches have arrived at the place where by their actions they are in reality saying to the Lord, we want nothing from you but your name. Just let us be called Christians is all we want from you. We want your name because it takes away our reproach. That is, if we be called Christians, then what we do can be blamed on you. You get the credit for it. Accordingly, the world has reached the day when God, in order to save the church, is finally compelled to do something as great and revolutionary as brought about by the first advent of Christ. And what could that be? The remaining verses of the chapter give us the answer. Isaiah 4, 2. In that day, when seven women take hold of one man, shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Remember those words, escaped of Israel. 
this verse shows that the time is now ripe for this glorious revolutionary uh, uh, revolutionizing of the church and of the world. Let us remember that history repeats that a dark cloudy day is always followed by a bright one. So this great apostasy is to be followed not by chaos, but by glorious revival and reformation, by glory and prosperity for all the saints who escape the vengeance of a great God. The faithful shall reap a harvest of souls, as did the apostles on and after the Pentecost. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, in the Christian era, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6. This very message, therefore, is the message of righteousness by faith to them that believe. In the day the righteous branch is raised, Judah and Israel shall be saved, and they shall dwell safely. Yes, the day is here when God's vengeance is to fall upon his adversaries, and the once trodden down kingdoms of Judah and Israel are to rise in prominence and power. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Jeremiah 23, verse 7 and 8. Plainly, this is the final harvest of the earth, the gathering of people from all countries. It is a day in which to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. This is to be the second and last Exodus movement. So great it will be that it will entirely eclipse the movement of Moses' day. Do we then realize that we are on the verge of a new day, a great day for the faithful, and a dread one, dreadful one for the unfaithful? <clears throat> Isaiah 4, three. It shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem, shall be called holy, every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. This verse clearly shows that while none of the wicked in the church will survive the purification, yet none of the righteous will perish, indeed, all that are left will be called holy and will enjoy even greater security than did his ancient people at the time they left Egypt. Behold, the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purify of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Malachi 3, verse 1 to 3. Okay, we'll go down to Isaiah 4, verse 4 to 6. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, and the Lord will create upon every dwelling place in Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and a shining of flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory she shall be a defense. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the day time from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from the storm and from rain. For I saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and I will be the glory in the midst of her. Zechariah 2, five. Anyone who knows the Bible can see that all these event, events are premillennial. So it is that this present apostasy is to bring forth the Lord's fruitful branch, that the wicked who are among God's people are to be taken out of the way, and the faithful, those that escape, are to be the servants of God and reap a harvest of souls of such of such as should be saved, that the day of vengeance is already at the threshold of the house, that his faithful ones are to be raised to prominence and power, that the greatness and glory of the movement is to cause the wonders of Exodus movement and of the early Christian church to fade into insignificance. This is found in the present, uh, the uh, literature called Timely Greetings, Volume 1, Number 30, page 17 to 20. So we see here, brethren, the 
understanding of the context of Isaiah 4.1, and that is that this is just setting the setting for what we should be aware of in the time of the season, the time of the judgment about to take place in God's church. All right, so now let's get on to the next point, and uh, we're going to discuss knowing more about the seal and the mark. So what is this seal? We want to know that. Matter of fact, I think it's more important that we know what the seal is than the mark. Because you don't want to be an expert in the mark and get the mark. You want to be an expert in the seal. Amen? I got some people come to my meetings. They ask all these questions about hell and the lake of fire. And I think you're way too preoccupied with that. Is that where you plan on going? So ask me more about heaven. Seal the law among my disciples. Okay, right there. If I were to stop, have you noticed the connection between the seal and the law? The seal of God can be found in the law of God, but there's more. So, so what is... Okay, now we need to distinguish something because Pastor Bachelor doesn't do it, and it's very important. We must distinguish between the mark understanding. So... There's two marks, and that is, he touched on the first one, the mark of the Sunday law, but the second mark is, I would argue with us, Seventh-day Adventists, even more important. That's the Ezekiel 9 mark. And inspiration doesn't fail us in describing what that uh, mark or seal is. What is the seal? Question number 21. What is the seal of God upon the foreheads of the 144,000? Revelation 7.3. Is it the Sabbath seal or something else? Answer. Being sealed in Christ with that Holy Spirit of promise, after, after hearing, after having heard the word of truth, Ephesians 1, 13 and 4, 30, the saints are consequently sealed by what? Present truth. The truth preached in their own day. Very important. The seal of living God, the truth by which the 144,000 are sealed, Revelation 7, 2, is a special seal, being the same as the mark of Ezekiel 9. And you can find the references from Spirit of Prophecy in Testimonies of Ministers, page 445, uh, Testimonies, volume 3, page 267, and Testimonies, volume 5, page 211. <clears throat> it demands one sign and crying over the abominations which defile him and which desecrate both the Sabbath and the house of God, especially against selling literature and raising goals during Sabbath services. As the saints have this seal or mark on their foreheads, the angels will pass over them, not slay them. It is equivalent to the blood on the doorposts on the night of the Passover of Egypt. The angels place a mark upon the foreheads of all who by sighing over their own sins and over the sins in the house of God show fidelity to the truth. Then the destroying angels will follow to slay utterly both old and young who have failed to receive the seal. Testimonies, volume 5, page 505. We encourage you to mark those references down and uh, look at them at your at your own time schedule. You'll, you'll be blessed because this is all supportive of what the seal is. So the former seal enables the receiver to rise from the dead in resurrection of the just, while the latter seal enables the sighing and crying ones to escape death and live and forever live for God. And this is found in the reference uh, to Answer, page 31 to 33. All right, now let's take a look at Ezekiel 9, 3 to 11. That's the mark we really want to know about. Now the glory of God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And it called to a man clothed in linen, who had the writer's inkhorn by his side, and the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. To the other he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Then he said to them, Defile the temple, fill the courts with the slain, go out. And they went out and killed in the city. So it was, 
that while they were killing them, and I was left alone, I fell on my face and cried out and said, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? Then he said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is the Lord hath forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see. And as for me also, my eye will neither spare, nor will I have pity, but I will recompense their deeds on their own head. Just then the man clothed in linen, who had the inkhorn at his side, reported back and said, I have done as you have commanded me. So in these uh, verses 3 to 11, we see <clears throat> powerful uh, warning of a church purification. And the ones that escape, as it clearly says, are the ones that do something. And that is sigh and cry over the abominations that are done within it. Within what? Within Jerusalem, which is signifying of the church. We'll get more into that in another helpful quote. But we've got to sigh and cry. It's got to bother us. We've got to uh, proclaim the upsetness or, or disappointment in our church. We've got to let the, the, the people know we're not on the side of perversion. I'll give you an example. We went to church today. And it was like, um, you know, you go to these music concerts before they, the band comes on stage. And you've got all kinds of talking and laughing and loud, you know, noise. That was what was in the sanctuary before uh, the church started. Okay, that's an abomination. We're, we're told by the spirit of prophecy we are supposed to be very reverent when we enter God's house. And we see no reverence whatsoever, whatsoever. And, uh, you know, to give another example, uh, these presentations that Amazing pa Facts has done, what do they do? They've got young women with these uh, short skirts coming up there, starting the program, singing uh, the, 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 the religious songs. And it's no shame. There is no sighing and crying, especially from the leaders here. And this is what this is talking about. You cannot be winking at this. This has to be something you sigh and cry about. All right, where are these abominations being done? Well, that we can find that in Testimonies, Volume 3, page 267. Mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth, wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by a mark by the man in linen, are those that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done where? In the church. Their pure love for purity and their honor and glory of God is such that they have so clear a view of exceeding sinfulness of sin that they are represented as being in agony, even sighing and crying. Read the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. This testimony is volume 3, page 267. So here we see once again, brethren, that the sighing and crying must be done of the sins in the church. And we also read that it must be done the uh, sins of ourselves as well. But these are things that are very important in order for us to get the mark. All right, when is the mark to be placed upon God's people? Well, we find that in 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall it be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? 1 Peter 4.17 The class who do not feel grieved over their own spiritual declension, nor mourn over the sins of others, will be left without the seal of God. The Lord commissions his messengers, the men with the slaughtering weapons in their hands, go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children, and women, but come not near any man whom is the, who has the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men that were before the house. Here we see that the church, the Lord's sanctuary, was the first to feel the stroke of the wrath of God. The ancient men, those are the leaders we're talking about, those whom God had given great light and had stood as guardians of the spiritual interests of the people, have betrayed their trust. They had taken the position that we need not look for miracles or mark manifestation of God's power as in former days. Times have changed. These words strengthen their unbelief, and they say, The Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. He is too merciful to visit his people in judgment. Thus, peace and safety is a cry from men 
will never lift up their voice like a trumpet to show God's people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. These dumb dogs that would not bark are the ones who feel the just vengeance of an offended God. Men, maidens, and, all, and little children all per perish together. Testimonies, Volume 5. We see once again that where does the, the Ezekiel 9 first happen? In the house of God. This is very, very striking, and it should be taught among these leaders. But unfortunately, the, the rod message, the shepherd's rod message, has been denied by the leaders, and we're forced to put it out here as laymen uh, to warn the people. All right, so now let's look at a cat playing with very striking. Is Satan working for God's or his church's interest or against? Uh, excuse me, is Satan working for God and his church's interest or against? If against, he will never do one thing to purify the church or to fulfill the prophecy. The only thing that would compel him to pass blue Sunday laws and go to make war with the remnant of her seed, with those that are left, Revelation 12, 17, is the purity of the church. When God, by slaughter weapons of Ezekiel 9, takes away the terrors which receive not the mark, and even then Satan will not enact blue Sunday laws until he has exhausted every other weapon against the church. We'll touch more on that particular statement. Therefore, as long as the church remains in her present Laodicean condition, there will be no blue laws or war against her, but a bluff only to make her members feel that they are free from his snares, that he is still trying to cause them to fall. But worst of all is in that they are sound asleep, which is shown by the fact that they still think Satan is working terribly hard to fulfill God's word by trying to pass Sunday blue laws and are not aware that he is only playing with them as a cat with a mouse. And the brethren to whom the Lord has entrusted the spiritual interests of the people, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 211, instead of sounding the alarm to arouse the church, are determined to even silence the voice of the rod and thus right, rocking her to a more sound sleep. You can find this in 2 Symbolic Code, number 1, page 9 and 10. So there's quite a lot here we can um, look into. You notice that uh, the even among some present truth believers, the fact is that Satan is not going to uh, <clears throat> enact this Blue Sunday Law until he exhausts every other weapon against the church. So it seems like he's going to use other weapons against the people of God first. So once the church purification happens, uh, we have charts and you can uh, review that in our other presentations of timeline of events. But once the church purification happens, there are certain things that are going to appear first before he gets together the, the people and starts this Sunday law weapon. And uh, right now, He's, uh, we see this all over the place in, in uh, on Facebook, in, in blog reports and all this, that many SDA are continually to warn already about the upcoming Sunday law. But what is uh, Satan doing? He's playing with them as a cat and the mouse. In other words, these Seventh-day Adventists, if they don't get the mark, they won't even be around in the time of the Sunday law. That's how he's playing with them. He's getting them sidetracked into a future event that they very well may not see. It's very, very sneaky what the evil one is doing. All right, so let's look at our summary. Uh, no prophecy is of, of any private interpretation. This prophecy presentation from Pastor, Pastor Bachelor did not give God's intended lesson to his SDA church. The sealer mark is being is to begin, it should say begin, brethren, in the house of God, not in the world. Many SDA will not experience the times of the Sunday law because Ezekiel 9 church purification will be prior to the Sunday law. The escaped ones, Ezekiel 9, Malachi 3, 1 to 5, Isaiah 66, 15 to 21, shall be the 144,000 who go out to preach the final gospel to the world. So we see that the Lord has a plan, and unfortunately, in this presentation, the plan is left out. There's no warning to the SDA church about the upcoming mark that we must receive. Instead, it was looking down further into the Sunday law mark. That's a cat playing with a mouse. 
Okay, so we have to be very aware of Satan's wiles. And even our leaders today, unfortunately, have fallen for this. They're not teaching and warning of the upcoming church judgment. So we hope you've been blessed and uh, we'll hopefully get another presentation on a, another Pinnacle of Prophecy series up real soon. Until then, may we hope that uh, you pray and that the Lord continue to guide you into all truth. Amen.